God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. And so last week, uh, this week we had dedicated this Sunday to be our financial literature Sunday. And I had a mission in time past that we will continue to educate ourselves as we move through this glorious year into the very purpose of God for our lives. For I believe that God has got something great and awesome and marvelous for all of us. And therefore, we ought to be ready to receive that which God has in stock for you. And so we will, as we proceed in this month, in this year, be educating ourselves and helping ourselves. Wisdom is principle. And in all that getting, get understanding. So our brother uh, Charles will be, will be helping to guide our conversation today. Why I moderate this service this morning. So this is not going to be the traditional service that we normally have. Because we have 52 Sundays in a year. <laughs> and there are many, many, many more things that we are going to have accomplished. So I'd like you to open your scripture to Matthew chapter 25. As we set the stage this morning to see what God speaks through his son, Jesus Christ. And the parable here, the lesson here, ties into our stewardship as expected by God. That everything that we have is not ours but God's but has made you and me to be custodians of those things whether it be wealth or whatever the Lord has blessed you with and as the Lord deposits these things in our hands he expects of us to do something about it and do something with it when the Lord gives you a gift, he gives you a brain too on how to use it. If he anoints you, he gives you wisdom how to use your anointing. If he blesses you one way or the other, he gives you the knowledge to use. And in the end, you and I will have to give an account of everything that God has blessed us with. And so we gain knowledge from the word of God for the things that are written are written up for time. So that through the patience and comfort of scripture we may have hope. It says written for our learning. God has given us quite a wealth of material. I was speaking to somebody the other day and said, Pastor, y'all, your Christians got so much wealth of material. You got 66 books. And you can't tell me that you don't get wisdom out of 66 books. He's a lawyer. And so you, you and I have 66 books that we can learn from every day. And it's up to you whether or not you're going to learn from it. You can keep on the shelf and let it gather all kinds of dust. That is totally up to you. But you can get into it and gain wisdom from the word of God. So beside the word of God, people around us can impact wisdom in our lives if I care to know wisdom when you surround yourself with fools not too long after that you will be like one of them but when you surround yourself with wise men not too long after that you will be like them to really depend on who is in your life and our lives are what they are by the choices that we have made God is good all the time. But we make choices in life. And I was studying under somebody who was teaching developmental psychology. And began to express how 
our current behavior is a consequence of our upbringing and how we have developed. And as it relates to finances, a lot of the things that, and decisions that you make relates to how you were uh, raised and your development. And gave some examples which I never forget uh, that our folks who are very stingy and the reason they are is part of their development. There are folks like me who would not want food to be wasted. Part of my development because I grew up where, where there was no, not a lot of food. So we had a fight for food. So even now, wasting food is not what I do. And some of you probably like me. And there are those who hoard things. Because in their growing up, they didn't have a lot. And they always think that somebody is going to take away the little that they have. And therefore keep them to themselves. And there are those who think that bigger is better. And would always seek to get that which is bigger than everybody else. I want to get a big house and big cars and big bicycles. Because in their own development, they thought that big things are always better. So they equate big to better. And so these are just an example of many more of how our lives are shaped by our place of development and where you came from. And so the choices that you make would impact how you manage that which God has given to you. And especially now that we are in a place of very high inflation and all of the pundits are giving us wisdom on how to navigate this time. But it's up to you Christians to do what is right. And I've learned that as long as I live in this world that's called a system and I need to play by the system even though I'm a Christian. Uh, sometimes Christians are too heavily conscious that they become earthly users. And so how we relate with this system will determine how successful we are. God has his part to play, but you have your part to play too. God doesn't do every single thing. He will not turn on your television. Doesn't matter how you pray. He's not going to load your dishwasher. Doesn't matter how you pray. That's your, my responsibility. It's not going to cut your lawn. Doesn't matter your bishop. You have to get that lawn or pay somebody to cut your lawn. He's not going to clean your yard or clean your room. You will have to do those things. But he'll protect you from evil. He'll stand against the powers that want to stand against you. He'll do the things that I cannot do. But that which lives within the realm of my possibility. God is desired that I do those things. So when I don't do those things, then failure comes. Because failure is compounding of different failed decisions that you and I have made. It doesn't happen overnight. Whether you run business or you hold a job, it doesn't matter. And in all of these things, God requests and requires that we'll be faithful. He said it's required in, in stewardship that a man or woman be found to be faithful. So the question is, how do you handle your money? And somebody said the other day, he said, if I were to look at your bank account and I see how you spend your money and how you give your money, I can tell exactly who you are. I can tell exactly who you are. And so God wants you and me to be faithful in the area of finances. And it's easy to blame God. And easy to blame other people. They say, well, Christians are not loving enough. Because the other Christian man, Christian woman, didn't empty his own bank account and give them all to you. When God has blessed you with something and you have not been able to handle it good. And over years, you wasted it like a prodigal son. 
and expect God to perform a miracle. But remember, the prodigal son had to return home. God don't blame anybody. Return home. Then I, I need to return back to God and say, God, I need wisdom. Wisdom to be able to handle things. You know, the Bible says that as long as the earth remains, that there will be seed time. And there will be harvest time. It's a principle in nature. Remember the days of, of Joseph. There were seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. That Joseph had to use the wisdom of God during the time of fam of plenty to prepare for the time of famine. All of us, all of us here today, one way or the other, you're going to experience either of these extremes. There will be sowing time in your life. There will be harvest time too. There will be time of plenty. There will be time of harvest. So you got to be prepared for those things. Not a time of blame. And I said this before. You can have a, a harvest time attitude when you are in seeding season. You can. And you can reverse it the other way. You can have an attitude of seeding when you are in harvest time. A false, abomin a false balance and abomination in the Lord. So God ought to give us the wisdom of planning. Remember what we say back in the day, if you plan to fail, you fail to plan. And our Christians who say, God has got it all. Oh, I don't want life insurance because I don't want to die. And especially African Christians say, well, not my portion. I reject it. <laughs> I just love African Christians, right? Uh, everything like that, I reject it. You don't need death insurance. No, I reject that. I reject that. Like you don't want to go to heaven, right? The only way to go to heaven, one of the ways, is that you rapture or you die, right? But folks want to go to heaven, but they don't want to die. So we reject this thing, but the reality of it. Oh, well, they're going to have, they, they, I mean, it's okay to do, go for me in New York and do whatever you want. But there are folks who, who rely on that. When I die, they take care of me. They'll go for me, do for me, and they take care of me. That is the most backward way to think as a Christian. God wants us to plan for our future. He wants us to plan for our retirement. The church cannot be, can depend on church hope to take care of you when you're old. You plan for it when the Lord has given you the grace in your active time. You know, Bible said, know the Lord in the days of your youth. Because the time will come when you will have, say, I have no pleasure. There are active days. There are active days. Active days of your life. I say that again. There are active days of your life. In those times where you are active, you are to maximize those moments and use them to plan for the time you are no longer active. What I used to be able to do back in the day, I can't do a lot of them no more. It is just biology. I could kneel down, get up, kneel down, get up. When I kneel down now for five minutes, I want to get up a little, a little difficult. <laughs> I don't feel bad for myself. It's just the way life is. Just the way life is. And time is going to come. I cannot stand like this. It's going to happen. Every human being, all of us, no matter how you try to block that out of your mind, we're going to get there. And we need to prepare for those times. Because it will come. And when I don't prepare for those times, they'll catch up with me. They'll catch up with me. And so the scripture that I just announced, Matthew 25, from verse 14, kind of give us some basis of thinking. And Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven is as a traveling man into a far country. It's a traveling man into a far country country. Very far country he goes. And, and if the brother can find the English standard version, if you can find that, yeah, I would appreciate it. If not, that's fine. We'll read the King James because that version kind of gives us more flavor to this story. It says, and the kingdom of God is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants. And deliver unto them what his own goods or treasure or money gave to them. And in verse 15, and he said to one, he gave, he 
He said, unto one, he gave five. Five talents. Five weights of treasure. Or what we call today money. This was written at the time, way back when they didn't have dollars. But today it will be weight of money. And he gave them five of them. And then to another he gave two. And to another he gave one. Five is more than two. Two is more than one. But he distributed to all of them three. And so there's not a man here, a woman here, whom the Lord has not gifted while he brought you to this world. You just need to find your place in God's plan. And so he continues to say, and to every man, according to his several ability. So each of us has different ability. You all, you have your own ability. You have your own wisdom. And when I lack, what is it say? He that lack wisdom, do what? Let him ask of God. So there's some people who lack wisdom. It's not a bad thing. When I, when I feel that I lack wisdom. If I don't feel like asking God, I cannot ask God because I'm, I don't have that relationship. Then I borrow from people. I pay others to do for me. I pay others to do for me. He that lack wisdom. So some people lack wisdom. It's not a bad thing. It's just what it is. And he gave to them according to their own ability. According to your ability. There are certain things you cannot do. There are certain things I cannot do. And I need to be sincere with myself that I cannot do it. And then have somebody help me do it. And that's why we have financial planners, right? When you cannot plan your finances because your outgo is more than your income. And that's simple arithmetic, right? When, when your outgo is more than your income, you're running negative. And you can only run negative for so long before you begin to crash. So when my outgo is more than my income, because I lack the wisdom to manage, then I start to ask God for the wisdom or find somebody who has the wisdom to help me and be willing to do that. And so the Lord gave them according to their ability. And straight away, he said the master took a journey and left them three to their own ability. Left them three to their own ability. You know, there are Christians who tell, well, we spend it all today. God will take care of you tomorrow. Wrong. Wrong. Oh, yeah, he will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wrong scripture. Wrong scripture. Can't spend it all today and think that he will supply all your needs according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You're going to be begging. Doesn't matter whether your pastor or your bishop does not matter. Scriptures had to be for the reason the scripture was written. Can't just pull scripture from the Bible and claim it and name it and think it'll happen. Otherwise, all of us will be so blessed and we'll need nothing. We'll be in no need. Because there's, a, there's abundance of scripture for you to quote and name and quote and name to bring wealth into your life. But it's not just that. He left them with the treasure. And said, do whatever you want to do with it. Then give them no blueprint. You have a job. You make $15 an hour. $17 an hour. God is not going to tell you how you apportion your $17 an hour. That will be up to you. You make $100 an hour. God is not going to tell you how to use your $100 an hour. He's not going to tell you how to pay your tithe. Your 10%. It's up to you. You can decide, no, I don't want and you can decide blow it all up. You can decide make purchases that don't make sense. You can decide do anything with it. It will be up to you. But guess what? He's coming. The day of reckoning will come. And the day of reckoning is not only the last day. It could be next month. When you have nothing. And nobody will give you nothing. Then the Lord will allow you to learn a lesson that whatever he gives to you, you need to 
be wise. Man. And you cannot blame them Christians say, well, they don't love me. That's why they don't give me. God shut up the heaven because he wants you and me to learn those lessons. So the next time you don't act like that no more. And so he, he, he left them with their abilities, no blueprint, and the master leaves. And in verse 16, and he now, see how the scripture moves from 15 to 16. No more details. And he moves on to say, Then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same five and made five. In other translation, they invested the five and got five. He that was given two traded the two and got two. He that was given one, one, did nothing with it. And as you read the scripture, the Lord was unhappy with the one that had won because he heeded, did nothing with it. Now imagine if he had spent it. Even though he did nothing with it, God was not happy. Then imagine how God would have felt if he had spent it. So that tells me how serious this is as I read the scripture. So the one that had five made investment, got five back. Had two, made investment, had two back. Got one, he did nothing with it. And the Lord took from that person that had one, gave it to the one that had five. He commended them. The one that had two, the one that had five. But no commendation for the one that had one. Basic principle. That everything God has given to you and to me. Is for you to get a return from it. A return from it. And it takes your wisdom. He left them with their own ability. Nobody told the guy who had five what to do with it. Who had one what to do with it. Who had two what to do with it. They were left with their own ability. So God leaves you with your own ability to figure out how you navigate your financial life. Whether it compounds to success or it compounds to failure. Whether you find yourself where you're in need and you have no fun for the raining day. And then you have to struggle. For some of us Christians, if your car would have broken down today, you have no way of replacing that car. If, if your house would have fallen today, you will have nothing to fall back on. If you were to lose your job today, you will have nothing to fall back on. If sudden events happen to you today, mother die, father die, you will have nothing to fall back on. Not because God has not blessed you. You were left, I was left, with my own ability. And I need to rely on that ability to bring myself to a place of financial sustainability. And that's the desire of God for all of us. I don't know about you. Most of us, some of us here came from a very poor background. They have a lot. Some of us, most of us here are immigrants. We came from far countries. How much would you bring with you coming from a far country? Just graduating from school. You probably came with a suitcase and some few pieces of, of personal effect and, and maybe some dollars. But over the years, the Lord has helped you to get to where you're at now. And God wants you to continue. Because he's not going to do those things for you and for me. And so today we're trying to learn what are the secrets of success and being able to be successful financially in this land so that when you are old or when you return to where you came from if you want to then you have something with you that the Lord has blessed you with because you have used your wisdom so I would uh, ask our brother Charles because he has been in the financial world for a long time and over these years he's gathered some knowledge 
And I'm sure that he'll be a blessing to you and to me today while he goes through some of the things that we ought to know as Christians. And hopefully when you leave this place today, you begin to practice those things that will help you to get to a place where you're not having to struggle through life. And that is my goal this year, that all of us Christians who are here will come to a place where you're not having to struggle through life. Not just, you will bless me, press down, taking the dead, I run over. Those are great scriptures. They're good. It's more than quoting scriptures. It's more than that. There's a work that you need to do. There's, there's, there's a place where you have to rise up every day and go to a place where you get paid at the end of the week. And you have to do that. Otherwise, you might just die. All right, my brother, take it from there. Let's go on. And I'll be moderating today. If you have questions, keep them. At some point, I will ask that we ask those questions. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. I have a sermon on this. Uh, since Pastor didn't do a sermon, I have a sermon. <laughs> Anyways, um, Brother Charles, for those of you who don't know, and like the pastor said, uh, I've been in the financial world for over 20-something plus years, so two decades. And uh, this is someone who actually uh, started up in a way of uh, going into medical school. Uh, in the uh, boarding school that I went to, I was placed in a medical class, you know, where, but I guess I didn't love reading like that then when I was younger. I loved to play. I played a whole lot of sports, host of sports that I was so good at. So I enjoyed myself in playing. So reading, to be in the medical school, you have to read a lot. And I was like, I was good with numbers. So I didn't need to read, just know the formulas, boom, 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 we're done. So I had that inclination towards math and uh, numbers. So I would help people on the other side, in the accounting and financial side, whereas I was in the medical. <laughs> so eventually, my dad was going to science, going to computer. So I went into computer science and all that. I didn't love it because I love to interact with people, talk to people. So I felt, okay, coming here to do my master's in finance was going to be a good thing. I can advise people and all that. So that's how I went into it. And uh, I recall very vividly, I think I heard Pastor talking about it doesn't like waste. I, the same. It wasn't like we didn't have enough. We did, but I just don't like it. It's like, why are you wasting things? You're not a good custodian. So it was just something like, that. I felt like, instead of wasting, why not utilize it in other ways and all that? Because there are other people needing it. So um, I went into finance and I recall very vividly during my wedding in 2005 a host of my friends were like oh let's do it this way let's do that you know wedding so it was all about oh let's pull this resources let's do this I said, okay who's paying for this I said well it's you it's your wedding I said no this is what I have and this is what we'll spend on it and they were like what is it one time one live event time and I said so then I put myself in debt they said, don't think about it that way. You gotta enjoy buy this buy. I said, no, no. And it, some of you might have heard this before. I said, I graduated my master's global business and I majored in financial management. So if I cannot manage my finances, I should just reap the certificate because it's good for nothing. Over 30 something thousand dollars, and I cannot manage my finances, it's a waste. So, and I told them that they were looking at me as a Somehow well, this guy kind of might be like stingy or what? I said, well, that's you. Because tomorrow when I'm in financial needs, if I call on you, you'll tell me, oh, sorry, brother, I have my own things and all that. So long story short, in my days and years of financial management, I found out that the majority of the people that have so much wealth, you really don't hear. And the majority of the people that have less wealth are the people that make it's just like an empty barrel makes the loudest noise and there's a huge difference between rich and wealth when you're rich you are more in expense than income you wouldn't even know that you have so much expense than income that comes in because you have a big house, a big car. I think that you've seen a commercial that said, I'm in debt to my eyeballs or something like that. That's a rich person. But a wealthy person has more in income and less in expense. 
And I hope this is where I would help us get to today. Maybe not today, but at least you start thinking in that way. So, financial literacy. I recall also at my other job, I was speaking to a Liberian man. And then he was like, hey, brother, I heard you in finance and all that. So, ah, I've left because I left the investment area and I went into operation. I said, no, no, I don't, even, I don't advise anymore. So he said, okay, but I need help. I have, it was almost retiring. I said, okay, let me look at your finances and all that. And so he showed me another. I said, whoa, what, what are you doing here? You should be diversified right now off of this aggressive funds and all that into more safety because of your age. And he was like, what do you mean? I, I, so I explained to him, I said, but I'm not going to advise you. You have to call where the 403B is and talk to them and have them move the money into this area. Because luckily, I saw him last month. No, yeah, this month. We're almost in the end of this month. And he was telling me, thank you, thank you, thank you. The market went crazy. And thank God that my investments are still safe. I said, good. So the other thing now asked me, he said, I'm trying, I said, you should be done paying your house by now. I said, no, because I extended. I said, why? Okay, you can still extend it. But you know what? Pay more into the principal. When you pay more into the principal, you will, you know. And he started doing it. And, and see, that's the thing. You need to know where you lack if you don't know where you lack that's a problem so you need to know i lack in this area and i need help so i'm just going to run through financial literacy i want to leave time for questions so some people are comfortable with living paycheck to paycheck they don't mind that paycheck and i did that i did that i lived paycheck to paycheck for a period i didn't like that i didn't want that but god was putting me through a process because when I got out of my college and all that, I wanted to be an investment banker and all that, going to money. But God told me, you love money too much. And you know what it means? The love of money is the root of all evil. So, and God knew that I might have just served money more than him. And that's why he kind of trained me through that area where I lived from paycheck to paycheck. In fact, there was a time that I maxed out all my credit cards and all that. You know what? Still faithful to God in paying my tithes. Maxed out my credit card. But when God started processing that, I was able to pay off all that because I knew that it was just that situation. We have to learn to increase our wealth. What I mean by increase our wealth is increase our income. And when you increase your income, even though right now you might not be making enough, think, how can I make more? How can I make more? Do I need to go to school? Be ready to go to school and educate yourself and push yourself more to be in a better bracket. You have to think about that. You don't have to go, nowadays in America, you don't even have to do a full four-year school and all that. You can take a certification that can help you out. You have to look for how to increase, especially now that you're young enough to work. Because there'll be a time that your body is so weak. I look at my dad now. My dad walks out, I'll be like, ah, I'm like what? You know, like, you know, it's going to be 80 soon. The last thing he's thinking in his mind is to, no, he's retired now. So let me run through this and we will go right from there. Financial literacy. Literacy in the sense of you know how to read, how to write, how to check your finances. But one thing that I noticed while I was in financial management, well, maybe because when I dealt with the white, it was different. But when I dealt with the, you know, Hispanic, African-American, you know, Africa itself. When you sit them down, in order to do a thorough financial, just like when you go to a doctor. A doctor will check every vitals and everything and all that. Take blood tests and not be able to tell you what. But so you need to sit down and do the finances, ask questions and all that. When you start asking some questions, they're like, don't worry. Leave that alone. But you can never give an advice without knowing the total view of everything. And some don't like it when you tell them you shouldn't be spending money here, but spend money here. Like, oh, I work hard for my money. Why are you telling me where to spend <laughs> spend money? But that's the thing. I had a a director then. She was spending over twenty something thousand dollars a year. She didn't even know that. On what? Starbucks coffee. 
She used to drink two to three each day. So we had to say, okay, listen. Or the financial advisor had to say, listen. You can buy this espresso at home, brew it and all that, and then she cut it off to about 5,000. She wasn't even talking about that. Wow, she didn't know. Imagine that. That's where she lacked. But luckily, she got an advice and she helped herself with that. There was a survey, which is a S&P survey. It said 70, uh, 57, sorry, percent, percent of adults are financially literate. And it's even worse off when you go down. The younger generations, they don't even care because daddy's got it, mommy's got it. They give me money left and right, you know, phones, everything that they have, gadgets and all that. Dad, mom pays for it. So they don't even care. And that's wrong. We have to teach them. And why? He said, never taught in school. Like I said, I was never taught in school too. But luckily, I love numbers and that kind of help. And I recall them when they get, so I went to boarding school. When they give me money, I won't spend it all. I would keep and even buy things to take home. But it was a wrong thing to do because they now said, if you have money to bring home, that means you have too much money. I said, oh, mistake. Next time I'm not going to. So I rather kept the money rather than buy something. You know. So, but yes, never taught in school. Never taught in school, it is a factor, but you can imbibe that in your own life and what you do. And then this, the other one was our parents never taught us. Luckily, my parents taught me. My dad was a lecturer, so he had, my, in fact, I recall then when my dad would give me money or write it down, he's giving you this money so that you can't come back and say, no, you didn't give me. And one thing he taught me then was he gives me money, it's counted. That's why if you give me money, I'll count. I tell my family, my kids, and all that. Because you don't want to go and come back. Oh, sorry, that money you gave me was not complete. No, but we counted it right in front of us, so we know. So he taught me. My mom taught me. And then the third one was sp spending lifestyle. There's a lifestyle already that I need to dress like this. I need to yes, it's true, it's good to dress good. But if you don't have it, you cannot keep up with the Joneses. Live according to your means. And then, the last one that I have here says the attitude towards money. Which means, I worked hard for my money. I know someone that, in fact, the husband said, there are clothes that, those clothing she bought like four or five years ago, she has no one, the label is still on the clothes. And there are like a lot of them. Bags, you just buy. It's like, I work hard for the money. So I need to buy. Macy's and everything and buy, buy. It's true you work hard for the money. But you can save also for the money. So that what we used to do those days in investment when I was advising, we say, let your money work for you. Don't work hard for the money, but let the money work for you. And how money can work for you is through passive income. So why are we talking about financial literacy? To keep finance, which is our financial statement, in good health. Just like when we go to the doctor every year. Please, please, please. If you don't go see doctor, I know it's finance, but if you also don't go see your doctor annually, please do that. It's, it's so important because I had people that I was advising them this mom. Her son refused, said no, it was a waste of money. And before they knew it, two years after he stopped doing it, he had lymphoma cancer. That is spiraled into the stage that they could not. Jersey here, New Jersey. She was crying, begging me because I was advised, I couldn't even advise anymore. Luckily, she knew I was a Christian. So I was now praying with her, consoling her. The boy died, young boy. And they said if he had come for his annual, they would have figured it out two years before and they would have attacked it quickly. That is also part of wealth building, health. You know what they say? Health is wealth. What else? 
economic challenges. We all know now there's inflation. Things are astronomically high. But if you have a financial literacy on your finances, you know what to do. You know what not to spend on right now. The coast might be clear later on. When the coast is clear, then you do what you need to do. But for now, you hold up. You strategize. Just like we say in the investment world, diversification. Diverse, diverse. Which means don't put all your money in one basket. Put in aggressive. Put in mead. Put in money. Markets. Put in bonds. Put in stocks and things like that. There will always be challenges, economic challenges, life challenges, and things like that that would demand your money beyond what you used to give or you have. Job challenges. We were on the prayer line on uh, Friday and we were talking about, we were talking about demotion. Yes. There are demotions sometimes. There are job losses sometimes. I actually lost the job once. You see, which even goes to why we need to build wealth. When I lost my job, which was due to COVID, yeah, a lot of people lost jobs due to COVID then because my market was uh, New York and New Jersey and Philly and they were decimated because it was a small business. But what happened? God gave me peace because why? I had built wealth already. So my passive income was what was taking care of me that period. In fact, I even said, you know what? I'm someone that I can work three jobs if you give me the opportunity to work three jobs. But I said, maybe God is telling me to rest for the next phase of my working life. So I kind of rested one month. I was rested. I mean, I was restless though because I knew I, I needed to work. I'm that kind of a person. So, but I strategized, prayed, and when it was ready, God gave me a job with almost double the money I was making before. And that's the power of God. But the key thing was, I had built my wealth. That I didn't even feel it. I remember the state calling me, telling me, hey, they'll put me on this. I just laughed. I, said, I looked at how this is what you want to pay me. Thank God. <laughs> you see, sometimes people want to rely on the wealth. Welfare is no, no, no. Welfare is slavery. I tell you, it would enslave you. You can do better than that. And when we're talking about building wealth, we're not talking about just building wealth for yourself because the wealth is generational. When you talk about people like the, you know, uh, Carnegie's, you talk to people like uh, uh, Schwab's, you talk to people like, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Bill Gates, you know, the Waltons and all that. Those are people that have built wealth. There are people those days we used to call an investor, we used to call them trust fund babies. These people are trust fund babies because what? They were born into wealth. And if just, in fact, I, I remember having a client. When the grandkids, grandkids have babies, she just, boom, 50,000 into the account for just one baby, boom. So one had seven. I said, if I had a grand, if dad like that, I would have 50. I'll just keep having babies. <laughs> I'm like, wow. All right, let me go in that succession because I, I want to give time for questions. Again, people are living longer now. The healthcare is good now. They can diagnose things quickly and all that. People are living longer. So because we're living longer, we have to plan towards a longer living. What happens during that period when we are still alive? What happens during that period? Financial products. Financial products are so diversified right now and complex. So sometimes you don't know what it is and you mistakenly think this is it. And so I'm not going to lie to you. We had people in the financial industry that time that would tell you what they want to tell you, you know, because they want to make sales. It's all about sales. They will pull you. And that was one thing. I recall one time my, my manager was saying, you should have sold that thing. I was a uh, one point something million dollars in New York. For a, a Jewish guy that I wanted to close. You should have sold it. If you had sold it, you would have made about almost thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars in bonus on my sales bonus for that quarter. We're not talking about even for that quarter. But I said no. 
I need to speak to this person live. He, he cannot leave me in the financial world. People cannot leave you on a recorded line and give you sales and you, you know, follow on. No, that, you have to speak to that person live. I said, no, he left it on the message. I cannot. He said, no, just do it. You know that. You call him back later on. Because if I make sales, he makes sales too. But luckily, I didn't follow through because eventually, he was fired with other people that he had told to do. I knew the right thing. And we do these courses and certification that tells us about this thing. So I didn't do it. And it was beyond my, my faith. I lost it. So people push you into the premise. That's why you seek advice when you don't. Before you make... I have a brother, a Nigerian brother. He called me recently. I know nothing about finance. I know you are. But I want to do this. And I'll tell him. I'll give him the advice. He will go on my back. And go ask other people. So, and, you know, what I say then those days when I was advising. Please, seek others so that you can now compare. Don't just think, except you trust me. Which I come as clean as I can. As I can. And I'm as clean as one. Because I know it's not just me now. God is also watching. But this brother went out, spoke to people and all that. He now went with what those brothers said. He got into trouble. He now called me again. He said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I shouldn't have done it, but please help me now. Well, you know, unfortunately, I could not just say, no, I'm not going to help you. I can't. God has given me the guilt, uh, the gift and the grace. I had to do it. So, but luckily, he left a very wonderful text that, you know, that, you know, I probably will read it out to you. He left a very wonderful text that after everything was settled and everything worked out for him, he was like, wow, truly, you're a, a man of God and God really uses you. My God, you know, but anyways, let's jump back to. Then we have limited government su support. We see now the government is in trillions of dollars in debt. And it's still going to go. They still want to write more, print more checks. And you see, government support. If you're expecting the government to bail you out when you're older, when you're retired, uh, you're in for a shock. So you better take care of it because government is taking care of themselves. You take care of yourself. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself. And that's why we need financial literacy. So now how? Key, you have to start budgeting. Budget is key to any financial advancement in your life. I spoke to a lot of people that, how much do you make? They don't even know how much they make. They don't even know how much they make. How much do you spend? They don't even know how much they spend. But it's okay, how much do you know you have in savings? I have no savings. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you just can't say that, but you know, in your mind, that. And one would tell me, well, I try to save, but my wife spends everything. So, <laughs> but the key thing is, a budget gives you an insight of what comes in and what goes out. And that also gives you, it's almost like a financial footprint of your finances. How much am I making? How much is coming in? How much is going out? Does this need to go out? Is this necessary? And that's how you see. And then you can start cutting off. I don't need this. I don't need this. And sometimes there's this feel like if I stop this, I'm going to die. No. No. There are things you can cut off. Like the lady that I was telling you about, almost 20 something thousand dollars on coffee. But then she cut it down to five, but she didn't die. She said she started drinking all the coffee, the K cups and all that. And, you know, it wasn't as bad as she thought. So it's the mindset. It's the mindset. Managing your debt. Debt is good. But it has to be a good debt. Just like when you buy a house. You see, when pastor, we were at the old church before we moved here. When he talked about buying houses that he's bought houses that we should invest in you see that's what you call the american dream when i came here and i believe for those who came from africa or wherever you come from who weren't born here and even for those who were born here none of you were born with silver spoon and if you were god bless you i came with two luggage and a knapsack bag and that was it the only money that I had was for a term that my dad paid for and that was it. That was it. I didn't have a bank account here and all that. But I built well right now. 
that my assets, when I put all that together, is over a million dollars. How did that happen? American dream. You can do it. This was someone who started, when I started, when I got out of college, like I told you, I wanted to go into investment advisor. I mean, sorry, uh, investment uh, banking. But God told me, no. Go, I went, started as a customer service rep. I had to sign a waiver because for my, my post, that was a job beneath me. But I said, no, I just want a foot in the door. I started on 30 something thousand dollars. 30 something thousand, I think about 39 thousand dollars. Well, well, way back then, it was maybe not too bad money, 2005. But for my rate then, I should be starting on 80,000. But I make way more than 80,000. I make over six figures right now. If I put my investment together and all that, I make. I'm saying that because I want to speak to you. I'm not here showmanship. You see, I have a BMW. Pastor knows. Before I buy my cars, even uh, my wife has a, we're already thinking about Range Rover. But I'm looking at it, the gas, where with the great gases right now, mm, maybe we'll have to, you see, there's nothing wrong in pulling back. I love Range Rover. My wife loves it. I have it. But for now, no, because we're taking care of those kids. We have, have two kids. The school they go to is over 20 something thousand dollars. No. <laughs> no, not, not, not yet. <laughs> not yet, because colleges. Hello? Colleges. Some solid colleges. Ivy Leagues and all that, they are over $60,000 a year. $80,000 a year. Imagine that. So you have to think far. I had a, a friend of mine that I brought here. He was an investment advisor that spoke here the other time. I had an issue with him because he said, going to LaSalle, don't waste your money having your kids go to LaSalle. I said, why would you say so? He said, because you can save that money for God. I said, no, 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 no. Thank God my dad didn't think about that. Because the school I went to, the boarding school I went to, was the school that got me to where I am today. Why am I saying that? Because I was someone that my dad, I didn't even know because I played too much. When you play too much, you forget even what yesterday was or what today is. My dad said I was so smart when I was young. I was so smart that I started school with my older brother. I wasn't supposed to start school. They said, oh, you think school is fun? But I was like, boom, boom. I did see some of my reports and I saw I was getting 100, 100 in math. Everything, I cleaned out the paper. So what happened? I played too much. I didn't read. And mind you, I never read when I was in school. Never. Never. I just read a little in the night of the day of exam. I kind of like cram. That's what you call it, cram. I just cram full. And I didn't, I didn't go less than half. The only thing is when I'm in class, I'm listening. Boom, that just stays. That's all. So it was that school that my dad sent me to. Spent so much money to send me to school, the boarding school. When I was there, I was with people that their brains were like smoking. When they work in their brain, is like, you can see like calculations all over there. I'm like, what the heck is this? So I knew I had no choice. I could not just do what I was doing in the old school, in this school, because I'll be last. <laughs> and that's where, and the school was structured. We had prep time, we had went to read and all that. So I, was, I had no choice, I had to read. So school is important. The good school. So if you can spend it now, spend it now. Because if you don't catch them now, they go to college and drop out. So we had a clash. He said, well, I think, said, well, you can advise that way, but I don't agree with that. Because if my kids want to go to uh, LaSalle, if they're smart enough, and I noticed that in my kids, that they were smarter than where they were. So I said, okay, I'll push you to where other people are smarter. That's how you invest in them. And I met someone who also went to LaSalle, was smart enough, got scholarship to Yale. So, we have to think of the future. So managing your debt, pay your debt on time. It's key. Some people don't even know. If I ask now, do you, when last did you check your credit score? Some people don't even know. And in America, it's a credit system. It's a credit system. I refinanced my house recently. I looked at it. I said, okay, based on what was going on, I can see inflation and all that. You see? 
when the government tells you all those things, I laugh. Because I've been in finance for two decades. I can see the writings on the wall. You see, that, that's why you have to educate yourself. Because the government are there all about policies. They're making policies. They have people to help. Yes, it's true. But if you're not careful, they will help people at your own detriment. So you have to help yourself. So I saw the inflation come in and I said, you know what? I have to refinance my house. It wasn't bad. It was at 4 point something percent. But I said, I'm just going to go 15 years. I have the funds to do that. I went for my credit. I built it. Oh, going back to what I was trying to say before, I'll go back to this. When Pastor was talking about building, I mean, buying houses, I was building my credit that period. Because I said that was my next step. I'd even bought a book that told us, that tells you about how to buy foreclosed houses and things like that. And how to like, you know, don't, you see, you have to be wise. You see, Luke, I believe Luke, says that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. I have a lot of people that don't know God. You see, I cannot talk about God. When I'm talking to my clients, except they bring it first. They don't know God, but they have so much wealth that we, we that God of heaven and earth, everything belongs to him. God owns everything, but yet the children of this world own them more than we. Why? <laughs> God has blessed this man. My pastor will say, don't be earthly useful. Sorry, heavenly useful and earthly useless. We have needs. God's work needs financing. And it is we that God will use. It will take a hard, hard God move to use an unbeliever to assist the church. But for us, it will be easy because we're doing God's work. Savings and investment. And this is where we build our wealth. Savings, save. Don't eat all your seed. Don't eat all your seed. Save, invest. Invest in housing. I tell people, when you want to buy a house, the sad thing was I didn't do that because my wife said she didn't want to leave with, you know. So I said, okay, yeah, let's just buy my own house for now. But later on, we will buy so somewhat our dream home. But I bought a foreclosed house where I didn't put so much into it. I just fixed it later on, put it into my taste or our taste. Buy a two, three family house. Where those people take care of even the expenses that you need to take care of. And then now you can invest that money. And eventually you can even move to your own single family house. And now leave that one and rent that out. There was a Liberian lady that I worked with when I was still in college. Uh, name is, she actually came to visit to talk to her about housing. Uh, Michelle uh, Berry. She used to be Michelle Berry. Then she's uh, Michelle Davidson now. She was talking about, she said she bought her first home while she was in college. I said, what? How'd you do it? And she used to talk about the loopholes. People just leave live and all that. Even for college kids, when you go to college, look for how to work and make extra money. You can work in the school. You don't need to work so good. You're working. It's good. You don't need to just take all this debt because when you come out, it's going to run after you because those debts are going to be looking at you in the face and they're going to be compounding interest on it. So the less you can, the best. And then when you buy these houses, you can expand, you can buy more houses and all, and it becomes a passive income to you. I have someone who has over 50 houses in Providence. Chinese. 50 houses. 50. He put his children into it and things like that. And it still works. And the key thing also, be careful. Be very wise to spot fraud. There are those out there that don't want to work but want to take advantage of where you put money. 
be careful of those that give you, oh, you can make 50%, you can make 75% and things like that. Be very careful. Seek someone else to look through that thing with you. There's a lot of Ponzi scheme out there. All that you've worked for will just... And they do that to the elderly a lot. Unfortunately, they do that to the elderly a lot. In fact, there's a government listing that we even have to take while I was in investment that you have to protect them. And sadly, it is not even outsiders. It is insiders that happens the most. Children, uncles, aunts, things like that. So be careful about that. And lastly, so that I can entertain questions. I know there are small business people, but the two major ways you can actually build your wealth in America easily is housing, real estate, or stocks, security markets. The other one is very convoluted. You got to be very smart about it. There's so much in interest, I mean, sorry, in sales that they make and incentives that they make, the sales advices and all that. But you cannot blame them because there's a regulation. You have to be licensed to do that. I, I lost all my license because I stopped. I don't want to even do investment anymore. I want to be more in operations. So those are the two key areas. But the other areas too could be franchising, small business, having your own business where you make money. You see, there's a quadrant. You're either an employee or an employer which is a big business or small business, also employed, or you're an investor. Which part of the quadrant do you fall in? If you fall in the employee quadrant, then you're living paycheck to paycheck. Except, and this is another key that people don't know, you can live paycheck to paycheck and also be able to build some wealth. You have to look into your 401ks 403Bs or Cs. If you have a company that matches what you contribute, contribute. It was the contribution that I did that I was able to raise over a hundred thousand to buy the three properties that I was able to buy. Because when you're buying a property outside of your own first home, it's about 20 to 25, maybe low 15, but you hardly even get that. 20, 25 percent that you have to pay put down so when the guy first told me that i said a hundred and something where did i get that from but luckily i was contributing that's where i was able to get that money from do that i did one with the other company that i said i would let go and when i looked at my account recently i had eighty thousand dollars in there i didn't even i'm like what i didn't even know i had eighty thousand dollars in an account that i even i don't even check but i'm looking to move that in now And I end with this. They were singing today. It says, I surrender all to you. And it says, Who has the finer say? We know God. But there are a lot of us. And I battled with that earlier. I battled with that earlier. If God does not have your finances, I guarantee you. You see, it was so loud. It was so loud. It was so loud, I could not deny it. That if you play with your tithes and offering, <laughs> you're playing with your retirement. Some of you, if you're not faithful to your tithes and offering, you see, every company, you can, if you find one, come tell me. Come tell me and I'll dispute it because you never... Any company that tells you I can give you 100% of your investment, 100%, a real investment, no, it's impossible. Why would they give you 100%? They need to take some too to invest more into their soul. They will give you, they say, when you start hearing 100%, no, it's Ponzi scheme. There will be 25, 30, 40, 50. But God is the only one that can give you, not even just 100%, God can give you a million percent. So if you're not investing in God's kingdom, you're not investing in your retirement. Someone 
told me the uncle made so much money in California, made so much money, in fact, retired early. He got everything into, you know, here when you were leaving, you put everything in your box, put it in his uh, porch, porche. Car was driving, roof down and all that. Not too far, they heard. He was talking about Malibu, many other places, was going to go, retire and enjoy. He had an accident and died. That's like the case in the Bible where the rich guy said, yes, he has everything, his bands are full, he's going to eat. And God said tonight, your soul is required. I say this because I'm in a church. If you're not faithful to your tithes and offerings, don't wait to retire and then say, oh yeah, no, no. 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 That is where you can invest and enjoy your retirement. Because sometimes you can have that money. If your health is not there, the money is a waste. You're just having the money and throwing it out in your wealth, in your health. You see, with God, you will never fail. If other investment can fail you, the market can crash. Even the housing can crash like in 2008. But God can never crash. If you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request, we would like to hear about it. Please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www.kingstabernacle.org. You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations.